Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Well, our best week ever. Yes. Record, record viewing. Very exciting. We thought Lady C. Smug face. Popular. Smug face. <laughs> well, we thought she'd be popular, but we didn't realise how popular she would be and controversial. And we've been criticised for giving her too easy a time, too hard a time, um, which means yeah. perhaps we're getting it about right. I don't know. I mean, yes, it's been it's been a, probably our best week ever. Thank you for everybody who watched and listened to the Lady Colin Campbell show. And <clears throat> also the, the several thousand people who subscribed, you're very welcome. Um, and yeah. that, I think, was partly a result of that show. But also you, Andrew, you went on and did a great interview with um, Andrew Gold on his podcast, Heretics, which is a favourite of ours. In fact, Andrew's going to be coming on here soon. <laughs> yes, exactly. All no, he's great. Talking to each other. Um, and I think that brought quite a lot of people. I've seen in the comments people have come from that. Yeah, to, 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 so we're to delighted to have you. Well, we hope there's some crossover in terms of, of what Andrew does and what we do. Oh, I think there is. And I think, you know, a lot of people have commented, and we'll get into some of the comments in a minute, about, you know, some of them thought we were rather rude to, to Lady Colin Campbell, or well, me in particular. Some thought we were too soft and easy. Um, some said we were always interrupting each other or contradicting each other. But one of the things we've always tried to do at the, you know, from the beginning of this podcast is make it an open-minded place where Andrew and I can disagree with each other. We won't always agree with the guests. We try to give them space, develop their arguments. We also try to challenge them. And, uh, you know, we're doing our best to do that. So, I yeah. don't know. And I, you know, I hope a lot of people res- respect that and, and like that. I mean, we certainly give people a chance to speak. Uh, and I think it's, it's important that there should be a variety of views presented and people perhaps should be challenged sometimes by things that they say and forced to back it up, which is what you would have to do in, in most other forums. Yes. Yes. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we're not just royal stuff. Uh, it's been a great joy just watching the – I'm slightly obsessed with the data. So I think we have 40-odd thousand people watch the Colin Campbell program, but another 10,000 people, maybe they're the same people, maybe it's you who are listening now, uh, took time to explore our other shows. Some of them have had a real boost over the last week, and those shows are a huge range of things. Some of them are royal. Some of them are historical. Some of them are miscarriages of justice. And a lot of people have gone to the post office scandal. That seems to grow and grow. Um, people have been watching the Jimmy Savile program again. Um, and even a lot of people have found the 1941, which is one of our very first, where we talk about our various theories on the Second World War. Um, and that give, brings us a lot of pleasure. Also brings us pleasure is the amount of cash you'll be giving us. Um, you know, 30 or 40 people very generously use the new thank you button to give us a, a small tip, which, and it's still there. If you feel the need or the desire to support us, um, it's not obligatory, of course, but it is appreciated. Yes, so we talk thank about you. the comments. Yeah. What were your favorite? Yes, do, do. Yes, I know you've been, well, we've been trying to respond to, to, to them as far as we can. Uh, and indeed, some of our speakers, John Harris, has been engaging with people on the Rudolf Hess visit, which is great. Yes, that's uh, another show that's got a lot of interest in the last week, actually. I think it nearly doubled its, its view count. Yeah. Um, so well, I, once people are bored with the royals, they go straight to the Nazis. Yeah. Well, I hope in future, when we go back to two a week, we might have one contemporary story and one historical story, and that will give people a, a choice each week. Um, and we can be slightly investigative with the modern stuff and maybe slightly more, um, well, about historical mysteries in, in the historical stuff. Yeah, well, talking of historical mysteries, one thing that's clear from the comments, people really do want to hear about UFOs. So there you are. We've got to do yep. that, Andrew. And now, and now yeah, I realise yeah, you're, no. UFO, you're a UFOlogist. Do you spend the evenings in the garden with your binoculars? I do, staring at the sky. <laughs> and people <laughs> wonder what I'm doing. <laughs> Thinking I've had too many drinks. Well, no, well, maybe I should uh, dust off my old notes. I made a whole program on Atlantis once. The Archaeology oh, yes. of Atlantis for the Drain the Ocean series, which was my last big TV job. Well, I've got a book on that coming out. I, th- I think we should have an open mind on these subjects. You know, it's very easy to make assertions and say they don't exist, but, uh, you know, it's worth looking at. Indeed it is. Okay, so loads of people. I mean, like hundreds. I think we actually had over a 1,000 comments on the last show, which is definitely a record for us. The most liked comment was TTY13, who declared Lady Colin a national treasure. 
And to which some wag, namely Phil Craig, said, I'm not going to be the one who says she needs a preservation order, at least not to her face. She would be <laughs> or you'll be a naughty boy. I'll be a naughty boy, yes. Uh, Lady Prudence, who was, I think, written before. Hi, Lady Prudence, your ladyship, if you're listening now. She wrote a really interesting post about the Hollywood culture that Meghan Markle grew up in uh, and how you have to understand that to understand her. And the key thing there, according to Lady Prudence, it's all about selling yourself, working your way into the confidence of influential friends and pushing forward using very sharp elbows into every available spotlight. And that's the life that she understands. And that's the mentality she brought to the royal family. And maybe that didn't fit naturally with the royals. I don't know. Interesting comment, though. Um, Bright Eyes 555. Five, five. Um, um, another comment. Um, this made me laugh. She was very keen on Lady Colin Campbell. Not so keen on me. The man on the right wearing the jumper looks bamboozled. <laughs> I'm glad. Are you sure it was you? <laughs> yeah, it was me, to which I replied, uh, that's just by resting bamboozled face. So there yes. Is, is that's, that, that's him a bit more animated than normal. <laughs> and a good friend of the programme, Alison Kent, uh, who I think also tipped us some money. Thank you, Alison. Just wrote the most lovely comment. Thank you for all the joy this show has brought to me since the beginning. Isn't that nice? That's Keep nice. Keep going, yes, scandal mongers. There you go. So this makes us happy. Um, what else to talk about? Oh, of course, we should talk about the new guests because one yeah. of the things we thought we could do now, we have a, a bigger subscription base, is we could ask people to do our jobs for us. So if you have ideas for questions for our upcoming guests, please email them. You can find the email link in the bio. Please let us know what you want to ask, and we'll do a couple of those every week. Um, do you want to introduce the next couple of guests, Andrew, since I'm talking all the time? Uh, well, we've got Hannah Barnes, I think, is going to be our next big one. Um, uh, and she's written a very successful and well-regarded book about gender realignment, really, isn't it? And the whole question of trans, which will be quite controversial. But I think we're looking forward to her. We've got Andrew Gold coming, possibly in a week's time, talking about his new book. Uh, we've got, um, I'm trying to think what else we've we've got lined up. Uh, well, if you have questions for Hannah and Andrew, let us know. And every yeah. week now, we'll let you know who's coming up next. And you can ping us an email, and we'll select a couple, put them to the guests. Yeah. Um, all part of building a community. And yeah. Podcasting which, 101. Which we're keen to do. And so, and, and, and you may get a mug. You, know, you may get a mug. If you're nice about Andrew, you may well get a mug. Um, we should talk about the next uh, this program um, and introduce our guest, who is a friend of yours, as they often are. Yes, Simon Varga is um, a long-standing uh, royal correspondent, long-standing journalist, uh, highly regarded, uh, and I think he's very interesting on how the relationship between the palace and the media has changed over the years, how proactive or, or not they've been. And I think he's going to talk about that. And I think a couple of other things. I think he, he certainly has some views on royal finances. He has some views on the William and Harry relationship. Um, but he's been following this for a long time. So it gives us a very good perspective. Um, uh, and, yeah, I mean, he's he's a, he's not written a book. I mean, so that in some ways, this is an opportunity to hear him talk in a way that we haven't heard him before, because normally he's just reporting on things. So I think that should be very interesting. And it follows on rather naturally from Lady C. Um, we're not going to do royals every week, but we thought we could just do a little little blip here. Yes. Well, I really want to talk about um, Harry a bit more because people will have noticed I'm a bit more sympathetic to Harry, certainly than Lady Colin, and I think probably also Andrew. Yeah, um, I'm becoming more sympathetic. And it's because of my sense of the, the deeper roots of all this, my own theories about that, based on the work I did about Diana um, a few years ago. And I want to ask him about that because you see, well, I this all of this goes back to hacking, I think. And what people don't understand, they should understand, is that in the years, certainly the years immediately after Diana's death, the royals did do deals with the media, and not just any old media. They did deals with the devil. I mean, that's a phrase that I'm sure that Harry would use. Um, a man called Mark Bolland was hired to be the spin doctor. He's dramatized rather effectively in The Crown. He became very good friends with a woman called Rebecca Brooks. And they were openly seen together, very matey in the same social circles, 
and everybody knew that stories were being passed back and forward. And these stories were basically meant to advance the interests of Camilla, Project PB, to get her accepted as Charles's future wife. Fair enough. I mean, you know, no harm in that. But Rebecca Brooks was involved with the News of the World and other papers. And everybody knew then, and we certainly know now, they were using all sorts of dubious methods, which would end up getting them all into a lot of trouble. And indeed, the News of the World would be brought down by this. So Harry saw his father and his father's people getting into bed with the very people he blamed for what happened to his mum. Think about that. Now, I don't accept what I read in spare about all the things he claims happened later with William and Kate, but that's where it comes from, I think. Well, he's very protective of his mother's memory. And, and I mean, we saw it with the, the, you know, the famous publicist Max Clifford, who would trade stories to protect one client. He would give the, the, the press another story. And I've seen that with my biography of Fergie and Andrew. I mean, Fergie is leaking to the press the whole time to 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 advance her cause in terms of divorce negotiations or because she feels she's been left out and wants to put a dig into Philip. Uh, and, you know, you you've, it, it, the press should be independent, but I, you can see that it's this lobby system that, you you know, clearly will take the pickings that you're given uh, and not always necessarily challenge challenge them. Something perhaps we could ask Simon about. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, because, you know, it was all during Harry. Harry's difficult public adolescence. He was getting into all sorts of scrapes. All this was happening at the same time as these, uh, this, this Project PB. And I'm not alleging that Mark Bolland did anything wrong. He was doing his job. And I don't know if he ever personally gave anybody a story. But he set up a series of relationships and confidences that certainly at the time we all thought, um, and certainly the people who wrote The Crowd also thought, were you know, meant to basically help, his, uh, help Charles and Camilla and, and everybody else could kind of get out of the way. Well, I think we've got this very situation with with some of Harry's cases that he looks like he might win, and it looks like people like Rebecca Brooks might be back in the dock. Well, I wouldn't say she's back in the dock; she's been acquitted. But I mean, some of these people may be re-examined because I think there are a number of journalists who quite clearly were much more actively involved in hacking and have not been punished. Yeah, I mean, all these stories overlap, and there's no clear right and wrong in any of them. But I think kind of thinking our way through it all. Um, it does involve looking again at what happened 20 odd years ago. Good. Yeah. Well, that's probably enough from me. Shall we go and talk and to Simon? Let's go and talk to Simon. Yes. Okay. Enough from me, too. Bye. Well, we're delighted to have Simon Vigo with us, uh, who's one of the lo- most long standing royal correspondents. I think you've worked for Channel 5 since 1997. Uh, and presumably, uh, yes. you've seen a lot of changes since then. I mean, how, how has the role changed and how has the relationship between the palace and the correspondents changed? Uh, well, I've been a uh, full-time royal correspondent since uh, 2008. So it was just after, yeah, it was at the end of the Diana inquest at the Royal Courts of Justice. Um, I covered, yes, Channel 5 went on air in 97. In fact, the first big story, apart from the election of the Blair government, was the death of Diana in, in August uh, 1997. So I covered that as well. How has the role changed? Um, they have got more um, professional uh communications people in at the palaces uh and i think the relationships uh the working relationship is better but you know fundamentally they are press officers they do their job we do our job um uh but they are more i think clearly under charles and william now they're more uh proactive more front foot uh they do explain as they did with both the cancer diagnoses uh they do complain and uh, and Harry obviously has taken that to a to a new level. Gosh, and I mean, when you say they're more proactive, I mean, are they sometimes giving you stories to protect someone else, for example, which is one of the Harry's claims? Uh, that is uh, one of the the claims that Harry makes, uh, hotly contested by uh, Kensington Palace uh, people I've spoken to, um, Williams uh, staff uh, or ex staff, and. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't mean proactive in that sense of a, of a, a, a press agent trying to, you know, do, do deals and um, uh, put people off the scent. Um, I mean proactive in the sense of, for example, with a cancer diagnosis, putting out a, a really helpful and useful and good 
briefing document ahead of that uh, six six o'clock in embargo, which it was on the night, um, and indeed with Catherine on the on the night that those two diagnoses were were made public. Um, yeah, the claims that Harry makes are uh, hotly contested, um, and uh, you know there are you know he he makes claims that uh, bad stories were were put in to disadvantage them. I am convinced the, the reverse. I mean, if that was ever true, I don't know of it. I'm convinced that the reverse is true, that positive stories in the early days, positive stories were were placed um, to uh, protect them, Harry and Meghan. Right. Obviously, well, you, it fell apart in the end. But You say that they dealt with, the, with the, the, the Catherine's illness well, but, I mean, it was only really when possibly material information was leaked and it was going to come out anyway that they felt they needed to do anything. We had weeks of speculation, which did quite a lot of damage to the monarchy and indeed her reputation. Yes. I mean, when I was talking about the proactive stuff, I meant the the, the king. Yes, obviously with Catherine, it was uh, following weeks of um, frenzied and febrile and, you know, uh, weird speculation. Um, uh, yes, and you, 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 ref you refer there to the... Uh, Possible hacking or the the alleged hacking of medical information at the at the private hospital was that the reason that they went public? I mean, that's obviously not what they've said. They have said the reason they went public was because the kids had um, gone on their Easter break. Their kids were still processing the information, um, and they were happy for it then to be published once they were away from school. Um, but yeah, the handling. I mean, I I've got issues with with what's happened with photoshopping and. And public statements, but uh, I know you spoke to this uh, with Val Lowe, formerly of the Times and a royal biographer. Um, and uh, you know, I I do think, as I think Val was saying, you know, somebody has a right to privacy, whoever they are, when it comes to their medical details. And clearly, for a long time, that that was the line they were trying to to hold. But then the the photoshopping got in the way. It was well intentioned, but obviously, if there was one photo you shouldn't be photoshopping, it was that one. I mean, what, what was the situation with the photoshopping? I mean, was it just tidying it up to make it look good, or was this? Did you feel that this broke down the relationship of trust between the press and the palace? Uh, both. Um, I think it was it was well intentioned. I mean, she's. I would have thought she's done it before. There's another picture with the late Queen at Balmoral from 2022, where you know there was uh, looks like photoshopping going on. Um, so I would like to believe them that it was just minor adjustments, but we'll never know till we see the original. And they're not playing ball on that one. They they won't release the original photo. So on the trust issue, clearly we cannot trust. You know what have you know, for the entire time that they've been releasing those happy family snaps of the kids, um, which is uh, 11 years now, um, that we can't go back to that because we can't trust uh, what we're seeing. So what we'll have to go back to an agency photo with Press Association or Getty doing it, an image that we can uh, that we can trust. And, and it won't be quite so natural, but why would they not, not give you the, why would they not give you the, the, the original? What, 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 what's to lose there? I well, I think they should. That I they have decided that um, they're not going to explain everything. So it's go back to never complain, never explain. They're not going to explain that because if they release that, then they've got to release another one and another one and another one. I, I think they just think it's a uh, a slippery a slippery slope on that one. But I think they should. Right. Yeah, I'd love to something we've talked about a lot on this podcast, um, and I'd like to take you back to the beginning of your royal reporting career uh, around that late 90s the turn of the century the early noughties when a man called mark volland who's been memorably portrayed in the crown as the the spin doctor that was brought in to to help uh, burnish charles's reputation in the years after diana's death and prepare the way for camilla to marry him and to have her own reputation restored now i see i believe that things that happened in those years are the long-term cause of a lot of what harry says today whether or not Harry and Meghan were treated badly by the palace, I don't know. Nobody really knows who was leaking what about who. But I do believe that in those days, he felt that things were done that were wrong, stories were traded, and also that his mother's reputation was dragged through the mud. And 
something I did, dug into a lot for my own book, the way that the, the palace helped certain writers say some very, very nasty things about Diana when she was barely in the ground, about how her mental health was the real reason why it could never have worked. Charles did try, but you know it was impossible because she was so difficult. And I think this long-term loyalty to his mum and her memory and anger about what was done then explains a lot about what he says today. Now, this is me spouting out to the guest. Do you think there's anything of what I've said? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with with a lot of that. I mean, he clearly feels that when they were teenagers, the stories about cannabis and so on were uh, anti-Harry stories to protect uh, protect William. And the idea that William's, you know, goody two shoes is 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 uh, far wide of the mark. But uh, it was Harry who who copped all the flack. I mean, he even actually blames William in his book for the uh, the Nazi uniform uh, affair, uh, saying saying that they approved it. So yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. They're they're clearly it goes back a long way, um, and uh, you know, from that book from Spare, you know, Harry uh, has. I think, you know, is, is more damaged than any of us ever knew. Mm. Um, we should have guessed, maybe. Um, but uh, he was, you know, significantly younger than his... They both went through a trauma uh, for many years, and Harry was, what, two or three years younger than his, his brother uh, when it all happened. The only... Um, clearly, the estrangement between them is, is uh, ongoing, sadly. Uh, the one thing... That they agree on the one thing that they that unites them is their absolute determination to protect their wives, which is all rooted back in the nineteen nineties, of course, and what happened to their mother. That's that. That's kind of tragic, though, isn't it? That they they oh, yeah. have sort of fallen out because both of them are perhaps being overprotective um, of the, of the the wives. So the wives just weren't getting on for reasons great or small. I mean, we've had it suggested yeah. it was tiny arguments about tights. And protocol, or it's something much more serious about attitudes to color and race. You know, we still but, don't really know what went wrong in that. No, he, he doesn't. He doesn't feel that Meghan was given a fair chance, and people on the other side of the fence uh, say it's the complete opposite. They're people bent over backwards. Um, I don't think Catherine and Meghan had much of a. Obviously, they were never best buddies. I don't think that there was much of a relationship there. There was certainly within Kensington Palace uh, a lot of anger at the way staff were being treated. By the new by Megan, um, that was that was uh, real. You mean that's why... being, being treated by Megan? Yeah, and that's that's been well. Val, Valentine's Val book, has yeah. talked about it. I mean, what's well, odd yeah. also is that Harry should be so. Uh, I mean, they should be making comments about Kate, given given this you know, this protectiveness of their wives. I mean, that was a pretty nasty thing. I mean, the leaking of sort of racial slurs and things. I mean, was that an accident, for example? I mean, was this Dutch? Dutch well, it's not, mentioned, it's not mentioned in Harry's book, is it? And in fact, no. he's since, as you've referred to recently in your podcast, he's recently said it was ne we never wanted to imply racism. Well, hang on, you let that story run for 18 months. Clear, even in the original Oprah interview in 2021, they actually contradict one another. When Meghan's on her own, um, you know, she's uh, suggesting that it was the comment was made to her, conversations and concerns. And Oprah goes, what? And then when Harry comes in, he clarifies. I think he clarifies that it was a conversation with him <laughs> yeah. months yeah. before. Months before she was even pregnant. Um, and that's never mentioned in his book. Um, but they let it. They let that run for 18 months, uh, or something like mm -hmm. that, before he then says, oh, no, we never said it was racism. And then a the book is published which seems to have had a – some kind of relationship with them. They certainly never d denounced it. And that, that book names Kate and Charles as the two people who raised the issue of colour, um, which was uh, really twisting the knife, I think. Well, if yeah, that's the allegation, isn't it? I, I mean, I've, I've got no idea what the source for that. Obviously, I don't know what the source for that is, um, and I can't comment, can't comment on that. But, um, Phil, going back to Mark Bolland, clearly he was very, very important. And, you know, for... Charles and Camilla to be in the position they were in when the late Queen died and the affection and the warmth towards them compared to where they were in 1998 is an incredible um, case study in slowly, slowly restoring somebody's um, 
uh, reputation because it was. Uh, but anybody I think a lot of people got trampled on along the way, to be honest. And because I was working in television at the time and trying to making a biography for for ITV, which is a you know was a important national network. I know from personal experience, I got to phrase this carefully, that uh, people at the palace in those days were not afraid to really put the boot in behind the scenes on powerful TV executives. So we don't want this covered. And if it is covered, you might find William and Harry, those lovely young boys, popping up denouncing the media. All that, that, that was happening to a lot of people, including me. It was yeah, quite, I want, I, it was quite I a sinister time, actually, I think. Yeah, I wasn't. Um, I can't. I know. Comment you, I know you can't. I, it's just I, me. It's just me rehearsing my scar tissue. But, um, <laughs> so where are we now? I mean, as you say, when the Queen died, you know, there was some concern: would King Charles be able to fill the gap? I mean, a, a very successful first year, and then the shock of the Ill, the two illnesses, uh, and the continuing problems with Harry and Meghan, and of course the problem of Andrew. Um, I mean, where does the monarchy stand now? Do you think it's it's pretty robust, or do you think that there are some problems? Uh, well, it's taken some big knocks, hasn't it? Uh, the king appeared at uh, church on uh, Easter Sunday. He looked all right and had a had a walkabout uh, there. Um, the in terms of uh, popularity, the Republican um, support for a republic is pretty solid at about twenty five percent. I've Jeff definitely made an effort to cover that side of things um, in in the in recent years, and it's what the in- really interesting thing to me is it doesn't go up and down that much, even with the death of you know the late the beloved late Queen. It didn't dip that much. In fact, there was you know a lot of affection and sympathy towards uh, towards Charles. So that twenty five percent figure is. Uh, pretty solid and much and higher it, amongst younger people, of course. I was going to say, it's mainly younger people. So as they get older, they get more mature, like Phil, and they stop becoming being Republicans. Yeah, so and me as well. You know, I, I, I was a Republican when I was in my 20s. I think actually it'd be a bit weird if you weren't. Um, but you get you begin to see the benefits of... I mean, obviously, it's nobody's priority changing how we choose a head of state. There are many more important things in the world right now than whether we spend a lot of money on a king or a lot of money on a president. Uh, it would still cost a lot of money. Um, but yeah, you, as you, you begin to see the benefits of continuity and tradition, history and 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 uh, all the rest of it. And we, we don't, I mean, we can rehearse those arguments, but um, we probably don't have time. Uh, so yeah, they are a much slimmed down monarchy, which has happened all by itself through to enforced absence and death and illness. But you know we're seeing Sophie and Edward step up. Prince Anne, Princess Anne, is still doing you know, uh, you know, lots of engagements. Uh, Camilla, William. Um, so I think they're showing their you know reason to be robust on that front. But yeah, it's definitely a wobbly time. If I was the communications secretary there, the perfect image would be middle of June, biggest day of the calendar, trooping the colour. If it was at all possible to have the king and Catherine in the same carriage, travelling down the Mall, smiling and waving, which is what they do, <laughs> that would be the image, wouldn't it? But, and lots of people on the balcony? Because, I mean, you talk about, you know, people like Edward holding the fort, but what's going to happen to the next generation? Do the next generation want to do it? And are, Or the ones who want to do it, are they the right ones? As in William and Catherine, or the ones after that? Well, you know, for example, people have been talking up Lady Louise as very suitable, but, you know, she may want to do her own career. Oh, yeah. Jenny is supposedly are keen to do it, but no one wants them, um, if there's any truth in that. So, I mean, there is a problem. They- they did, they did there are certain charities that they they do public engagements for um well the next general yeah obviously harry's children we we assume will be in, still be in california uh, but they are that they are a prince and a princess um as is their birthright uh the next generation would be george uh, charlotte and louis and um you know george served a bit of his apprenticeship being a page boy at the um at the coronation he's seen He's seen what's coming down the track. Um, So slim down, yes, but I think, uh, you know, it's a family firm, as you know, that's been going for a a thousand years and um, they've they've got through worse than this. And you see some people coming back. I mean, could Prince Andrew, for example, come back? You know, there he is, front of house at the Easter service. Yeah, 
And at King Constantine's memorial service, he was uh, he was uh, at the front there, wasn't he? I mean, he is still in the line of succession. That's about it. I mean, no, I don't see a, a comeback. Maybe he thinks there's a, there's a comeback there, but I don't think William or Charles do. He's a knight of the That's garter true. still. I That's mean, they could take that away if they were really upset with him. Yeah, they they. But it's not a pat. It's not like a patronage or a charity role, is it? Or a, you know, being colonel of the Grenadier Guards. It's different. It's a, that's a sort of personal gift given by his mother. Um, so he's still family, and uh, but I don't see a return to to public duties uh, uh, for him, um, particularly Can after we- you, when your book comes out, Andrew. <laughs> well, who knows exactly? He may be exonerated. Yeah, that's going to finish him for good, I think. <laughs> what I've heard, but um, no, no, there's no way back. I mean, you you you. you don't you judge people by the friends they keep? Yeah, yeah. I well, mean, he's the, very loyal person. Really, the really big one would be William and Harry getting back on good terms, and in particular, Meghan and Kate getting back and publicly. Yeah, well, we, I mean, this I mean, is I, a perfect time for them to do it. Now she's. Yeah, swift. I don't. I don't see how it can ever be the same. Really, it too, there's too much really? water under the bridge. But they've got to start speaking. It is the family business, people. after all. It is a family. When business. When it comes to it, he is a royal duke. He is a prince. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be, I'm sure the King's dearest wish is for those two to, to start talking to each other again. I mean, uh, Harry obviously did come over for a very brief visit. To see his brief, father, wasn't it? it was half an hour, 45 degree. minutes tops. Uh, and William was around, but, you know, still clearly, you know, they are estranged and, you know, it happens in every family, uh, or most, lots of families, um, and it's happened in this one on a on a very and it was I think so unnecessary and avoidable, but I think egos got in the way. I'm yeah. interested about this question of the news management because I mean there's some papers, for example, that seem to be given and indeed news channels that seem to be given slightly pre- preferential information by the the royal household. Um, maybe there's some journalists likely who've got very good contacts or Valentine uh, and can able to draw on those. I mean, how does it work? I mean. You clearly, you know, you've got to be proactive. You say you're looking at Republican, the Re- Republic as an organisation. You presumably have built up over over this period of time very good contacts, who will brief you and 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 tell you about the accuracy of what you're being briefed, perhaps somewhere else. But how does it work? I mean, are you all, uh, in some ways, doing your own thing, or are you all pretty much corralled to sort of basically report what they give you? Well, a bit of both. I mean, yes, there are, you know, there, there are clearly stories, you know, that's very well sourced stories. Um, the problem, the difference between print and broadcast, as you know, is that in broadcast, we need somebody speaking on camera generally. Um, and um, print uh, uh, doesn't need that. So that's where those stories really lend themselves to the excellent um Royal correspondents working, you know, my colleagues in the, on the print side of things. So uh, we all generally get along. Um, there is, there, you know, we are trusted with embargoed information. For instance, the the cancer diagnosis. We had a press briefing on that at uh, four o'clock, and we were all trusted to abide by the six o'clock embargo. And that, you know, works. Obviously, that has to work for everybody. If if somebody breaks that, then they are you know, cast out of the circle of trust. But are we with withholding stuff or trading stories the whole time? Um, not not in um, broadcast, and I doubt that much in print, actually. Um, do they tell us the whole truth? No. Um, I, they very, I mean, I can't really think of a, an example where they outright lie. Um, but do we ever get told the whole truth? I doubt it. Um, if we... If if we go with a story to them, and there's an outright flat denial, then you know you have to, depending on your relationship with that person, you have to trust that. And I know, obviously, I haven't been burned by that in the past, but I know people have been burned in the past on that front. If they don't comment, sometimes if they don't comment, that's a sign. I mean, right. I, one thing I've learned after doing this for all these years is that it's often what they don't say and what they don't do, which is as important as what they do do. Um, And do we have 
two sort of in the past when we talk about Diana's Day, I mean there were sort of different households kind of briefing against each other. Is it a much more coordinated sort of communication strategy now, where William and Charles' households are working closely together? Well, right now, incredibly closely together because it is only Camilla and William who are who are doing stuff. They can't. I mean, they talk about they have the grid, you know, and deconflicting certain events, and you know, trying not to overshadow various things, which they do. They do that. They, I'm sure that the uh, the communications teams are in touch. Are they warring against each other? No. Were there conflicts between the late Queen's? Um, press office and Prince Charles's press office at Clarence House. Yes, because that was that was his operation, um, and he didn't want those those communications offices put together. Um, well, they they tried, but it didn't didn't work. Um, yeah, so they're, they're working very closely together at the moment. I don't think there's any you know big uh, big war going on. I mean, Christopher Guy was clearly who was the Queen's private secretary. He was very widely respected, and I think you you refer to the sort of the fact that there was some problem there. I mean, do you think that his absence is being missed, or have people, be, you know, who who the King's private secretary fill that gap? I mean, whether Clive or Edward Young. Yes, Harry, well, Harry had had a lot to say about all of them, didn't he? In in his book, I've forgotten it was the Wasp. Was it uh... the Fly or the Wasp? Or... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think a uh, guide uh, clearly was missed. Um, but, uh, it seems to be, I know you, you were critical, Andrew, of, uh, of, uh, Sir Clive in, in a recent, uh, in a recent edition, but I mean, he, there's no doubt he, he's, he's an operator and, uh, and, uh, he's, he's been, you know, very trusted by the King for, for many years now. Um, they reflect, they reflect their boss, don't they? And, uh, they, they, they don't survive very long if, if, if they don't reflect their boss's wishes. I think it's, you know, the, the, the transition was smooth. There was a, you know, there was a crossover period there. Um, but these private secretaries that you're referring to clearly are, you know, can be and are very important. And, um, I think the transition was, was pretty, pretty smooth, really. Um, and what do you feel about the Commonwealth? I mean, we've had, you know, some royal tours which have been quite controversial. It, it, it yeah. seems the royal family got blamed, but it seemed to me perhaps the Foreign Office preparing those tours didn't perhaps brief them properly or didn't think it through. Well, I mean, I do I I don't feel sympathy for them that often, but with the with the Jamaica um football pitch. I wasn't there for that one, unfortunately, but for the Jamaica football pitch one, my understanding was that Raheem Sterling was there. All the kids were behind the fence. Raheem goes over, shakes hands and high fives over the fence. Um, all photographed. Those pictures don't get used, of course. The pictures that got used were the pictures of William and Kate later going over and doing the same thing. So that was unfortunate. Um, and, you know, they they were trying to... It's not a big media operation, and they were trying to media manage it, but there comes a point with, with royal events and and royal tours where you, you, you just have to go with the flow. And, um, you know, obviously those images were not what they wanted. Jamaica, on the wider Commonwealth issue, um, Jamaica's, I think mightily hacked off that Bahamas beat them to the punch. Uh, sorry, but Barbados beat them to the punch and um, Barbados became a republic um, a couple of years back. Jamaica's been talking about it for ages. In fact, I was there in 2012 when the prime minister hugged Harry and it was seen as some big um, charm offensive. It wasn't really, but uh, you know, Jamaica was talking about it then and is still talking about it. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, is, uh, I think, in good shape. I mean, there are lots of countries joining that have no uh, historical link to the uh, British Empire, like um, you know Gabon and Togo. Um, the number of Commonwealth realms, which is the countries which have the king as their king, you know, is still fifteen, and that out of the fifty-four, it's still fifteen, in which is weird in my view um you know you you would have thought that by now australia canada would have had that would have their own um, head of state 
Uh, there are smaller countries in the Caribbean and the South Pacific that just, you know, when I've, maybe I've been speaking to biased people. I probably have been speaking to biased people when I'm there, but they're in no big rush to have their own head of state for practical logistical reasons as much as, as much as anything else. And they, they have that sort of um, backstop of, of the protection of the crown. Um, but yeah, I, people sort of get confused about Commonwealth countries. You know, it's only a small minority that have the king as king. Most of them are republics like India and now Barbados, and probably you, Jamaica. You know, you, you, you mentioned the Crown. I was going to mention the TV program, The Crown. I mean, has that changed attitudes, either pro or anti? Do you think um, a lot more interest, a uh, lot more questions to me from uh, uh, young younger people, young people, especially uh, Americans. Younger, I, think, you know, I think I think Amer Americans of a certain generation know 90% of their royal history and their British history through that yeah. one TV series. Yeah, that's a bit of a worry. Um, yeah, you should have, have Hugo Vickers on. He's he's literally <laughs> written the book about all the inaccuracies in the crown. Some of them don't matter and some of them do matter, particularly when it comes to Philip, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot more interest. Uh, it's it's a fantastic, obviously it's an amazing programme, amazing uh, drama, but uh, not all factual. And they could have, you know, all they needed was the disclaimer at the start saying based on true events or whatever, but they they refused to do that. They had it on the online stuff, I think, but not on the the, the TV downloads. Um, yeah, a lot more interest, but the Americans treat them as celebrities. They don't, there is, there is no reverence whatsoever, as we saw with the talk shows and Catherine and, you know, Princess Kate, as they call her, Princess Kate vanishing or Princess Kate disappearing. She hadn't vanished. She hadn't disappeared. I think that side of things got, you know, way out of hand. That that was... Yeah, the Stephen Colbert... Turbo charged by social cringy. media. Um, and she felt under, you know, she felt under pressure. And she, you know, they released that Mother's Day photo and it went downhill from there. Mm. Um, I hope those people wouldn't have said what they had said if they... <clears throat> knew then what they know now mm -hmm. um i there have been people who have been quite contrite and i think quite rightly i you know if i was then why why can't why can't you have medical privacy why do you have to share everything i don't get it i mean it's uh they've released it now but i guess there came a point where they had to because she obviously won't be doing public engagements Mm. Now we're in the post-Easter period, which is what we had been told in January. She won't be doing public engagements, so they have to. They well, have I think it's maybe at the a... beginning they didn't realise how serious it was, and then when, no, when they no. did, perhaps that was around the time when William made that mysterious no-show at the funeral. Maybe that changed. Well, it, it was, yeah, it was. That was related to yeah. her treatment. But it's. But I suppose you know there was a vacuum created. You know that she wasn't being seen. No, no, there's no information being provided, and so into that goes speculation and fantasy. Um, so, in some ways, it needs doesn't to mean be it's right, though, Andrew. Much. Sorry, doesn't mean it's right. No, no, no. I mean, I think the problem is, as you say, the more that they give, the more that people want, and and in some ways, the Queen's approach of 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 basically never explain, never complain, kind of worked because yeah. it kind of drew the lines uh, there. I mean, yeah. you. Been a newscaster, you've been a foreign correspondent. What, what is it that you most enjoy about being uh, covering the royals? Because in some ways, maybe it, it could be quite limiting to someone who, you know, clearly has done lots of other things. <laughs> yes, well, it is. Um, yeah, I haven't been a, a foreign correspondent. That was a dream once upon a time. But uh, as it turns out, being a royal correspondent has taken me to countries I would never have gone to otherwise. So very incredibly special places like the Solomon Islands and, and Bhutan and I feel very privileged to have done that. Yes, I covered I covered the Diana inquest at the Royal Courts of Justice um, for six months. It went on for. They demolished every single conspiracy theory, didn't change anybody's mind at the end of it. A very British thing, spending millions of pound on this, pounds on this, and it didn't change anybody's minds. The people who thought it was masterminded by Prince Philip in a bunker under the Green Park still believe that. And her friends... Um, who gave evidence say you know it was a it was a road traffic accident um so i covered that for six months and at the end of that my my boss said right you're going to be royal correspondent and i said no no no, i'm a serious journalist i don't i don't want to do that and uh, he said we'll just do it it's a very good chance for, for foreign travel and he was right because it was um 
exactly the the time that uh, Harry and William went into the army and were doing more and more mm. um, public engagements. Um, and yeah, 20, uh, 2010 was William's first proper royal tour representing his grandmother. He went to New Zealand. Um, Did you go on the, any of the Harry and Meghan tours, like the famous? Yes, well, there are only two. One. Yes, I went on both. <laughs> I mean, you, you, I think you get a sense on the tours, a, a better sense of what's really happening. Yes. Uh, did you did you have that impression? Yes. Um, the first, the only really big tour they did uh, was Australia, New Zealand, um, Tonga, and Fiji, and it, that was you know so that's a few months after they got married. And that was just weird uh, from the get-go, really, um, because uh, he was – there was one particular engagement – well, there were various, but there was one particular engagement where he he just glared at us for like two hours during this um, long opening ceremony in Fiji. I think Val mentioned this uh, to you. Uh, so we're out in the – baking sun in a, a media press pen with no shade whatsoever i don't expect people to feel sorry for us <laughs> uh, they're under they're under a uh, canopy somewhere and while he's sort of paying attention to the welcoming ceremony which went on and on and on he's also glaring at us as if it's our fault <laughs> um and we're thinking this is a bit weird and then in the in the plane on one of the journeys um uh he came to the back and said um something like that thanks for coming but i didn't invite you which is like well you know you're grandson of the queen and this is an official visit where you're representing the queen so you know we are invited actually um so there was no there was no there was no off the record chats like we used to have which were really useful actually i mean it's a shame that we can't record them but um, that was the only time you could ever really have a good uh, chin wag. Um, and then the, the the one the following year was to South Africa, and that's when it all fell apart. I mean, that was when they were recording the um, uh, the initial Tom Bradby um, interviews, although I don't think they, they realised quite what they were going to get. And at the end of that is when the, the court cases uh, uh, were launched. So it was all... Yeah, that was. Could that you was, tell yeah, that, that Megan wasn't enjoying it even before she talked to Bradbury? Um, well, no. I mean, she, she's. I thought, well, it shows how much I know. I thought she was. <laughs> uh, oh, she's a very good actress. But you know, the I mean, there was I, there was one particular walkabout in Melbourne, massive walkabout that harry and megan did and she was fantastic i mean she was she is absolute box office um i think she did i mean i don't think she hated everything um she she enjoyed she enjoyed bits of it but uh they did how, they much, clearly... it, how much sorry to interrupt, how much it been handled better i mean in, in, do you think that they could have been kept within the royal family in some capacity if yes. there's been if if wasp and whatever hadn't uh behaved in the way that they did yeah, well, Harry f feels that he was given an ultimatum at the Sandringham summit in, in early 2020. He thought there was a middle way where they could perhaps live in South Africa or live in Canada and, and come back to the UK for the very busy royal months in the spring and the summer here. And their view uh, hardened that you can't, you can't cash in um, and still be a um, you know, a working member of the royal family. I mean, they are they are caught in that dilemma, and we we the public sort of have to decide what we want here. Do we want to keep paying for them the way we pay for them, or are we going to let them make money? And you, we can't have it both ways, you know. And Harry f felt in the end it was a binary choice, and he went straight for the airport. And uh, but I think it was preventable. But but uh, but by that point of early twenty twenty. The egos, the bruised egos, were, were too bruised. I think. You don't think he was like the Duke of Windsor? He was always looking for a way out, and and his wife provided the excuse. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I I can completely see that that being his point of view. Why do I want to be part of this anymore? To be, I genuinely don't think he cares about where he is in the line of succession, but you know, from being. The pinup, the party prince, the the soldier prince, 
to being you know less and less uh, relevant. The sadness is that you know some really important roles were bequeathed to him by Prince Philip, for example, um, Captain General of the Royal Marines. Um, I mean, obviously, this doesn't take all year to do, but they are important roles. Um, representing the royal family at the the Garden of the Field of Remembrance at the Abbey, which used to be the Queen Mother, and then was Philip, and then was Harry, and now it's Camilla. Um, so there were there were important things for him to do, and we also see the Royal Marines now. They're trying to subsume them within, or basically cut cut them, haven't they? I mean, I remember talking to one of the Royal Marines with, with the Prince Andrew book, saying, you know, we needed a, a friend at court, which is why they let him through the selection process. Um, and it seems to me they've got no one fighting their corner now, and presumably that's damaged them. Yes, although uh, I'm pretty sure that the king is the uh, is the new captain general of the uh, Royal Marines, so uh, that's that's a pretty good safety catch. Oh, I would, right, I would have thought. So, so they're okay. Yeah, um, I think it's the king. I, I my mind might be playing tricks with me there, but uh, it has. I think the Royal Marines are, are okay for the time being. Yeah, I can completely understand that narrative with with Harry. Um, go and go and make money rather than being expected to account for every pound and penny at uh, you know sitting in Windsor. Um, and you know, good luck to him. But and do you see others doing the same? I mean, you talked about the new generation coming through, but surely they'll want to do the same thing. You know, well, I think they Edward, they... Edward and Sophie did eschew the uh, the royal ranks and titles, didn't they? For their because he obviously Edward is the son of a monarch, so his children, I think, have that right. I'm the, I'm I'm a bit sketchy when it comes to the minor royals, but I think they could have been. Um, pr- yes, I'm sure they could have been prince and princess, but they yes, the lads of Stuart at eighteen, yeah. I think. Right, um, and the. The Zara and Peter model is is the one that they're going for, where they can, you know, they are not HRH, they are not titled, they can go and make their own money um, without people wagging their fingers. Um, so but it's sure always a pro- problem for them, isn't it? Because I mean, there's been criticism of Zara and Peter Phillips because they have made money and clearly trading off their royal connections. You know, it's what Sarah Ferguson has been doing for years, even though she's no longer HRH. So in some ways they can't really win because um, whatever they do, they're going to be criticised. They try and make money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not Lindley it's, it's the world's tiniest violin, but I mean, we do have to decide what what we want here. Do we want to fund them? No, we we don't want to fund them. Surely, so they've got to be out, allowed to make money, and you know that's led them into some scrapes, obviously. Um, but uh, I would say that's yeah. You know, I, I would say Princess Anne was was. Uh, very enlightened when she said, no, we don't want them to have titles. And how do you feel Camilla's doing? I mean, do, were, are you surprised that, you know, she is this popular figure now, and an important figure, given what was happening in the 1990s when Phil was writing? Yeah, well, it's amazing transformation, isn't it? Um, I think people, I mean, obviously, time time is a great healer. Um, people have, in, in the intervening years, when she was enemy, public enemy number one, people accept that actually it wasn't her fault <laughs> that it happened um it was you know uh, it she she didn't mastermind the whole thing um and it's been a very slow process with her hasn't it um uh, she is from the people you speak to that she deals with um very warm very genuine um she has a few particular causes very close to her heart. I've I've done um, filming at her domestic abuse charities, and there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. What you see publicly is, you know, the public bit, but there's, you know, there's a lot going on behind that. Practically, and in terms of, um, you know, getting money and, and, and all the rest of it. Would you say that some of the best royals, sorry to interrupt, are the ones who are not born into it? I mean, Camilla, Kate, Sophie, they kind of understand it, in some ways better than the people who have yeah. always been. Right. No, it's a, and it's a really good point. I think there's a book in there, actually, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, well, you should write it. You should write yes, it. Yes, you should. It'll be interesting. Um, I've been trying to find something yeah. to do that. <laughs> there is a, it's a very uh, powerful thesis that they, they, they see, Philip in particular, they see the, the whole thing, yeah. um, the good stuff and the bad stuff, and um, can, you know, reform it uh uh, reform it from within. I mean, it's, it is 
very hard to imagine marrying into that family, isn't it? It's it's with all that goes with it. Yeah, it must be. And, I mean, um, I think with Camilla, I mean, I'm the biggest Diana fan you'll meet, but I mean, it's obvious that Camilla makes Charles happy. And for whatever happened in the past, the rights and the wrongs on all sides, that that worked. And there's been a re- the stability to his life, and God knows he needs it now, but, you know, the, in the last few years, it's been obvious that it just is a relationship that the, the, the nation's come to accept. Yeah, um, they should have got married in the 70s. They should have got married in the 70s. Well, the then, crown has helped as well. I think the crown has made people realise how, how kind of bonded they were. Yeah. yeah. But if they, had, by the way, the if, they had got, if they had got married in the 70s, there would be no William, no Harry. So, um, yes, gosh, that's, that's an interesting thought. Great counterfactuals. That's another book for you, Andrew. <laughs> It's been brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. Yeah. I mean, we've really covered a lot of ground. Much appreciated. Here. And you know, to Pleasure. have your expertise over such a long period of time too is is really fascinating. Well, you know, thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't have uh, much uh, or any scandal to uh, to <laughs> to buffet, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, the the truth is. Um, I always believe in cock up rather than, rather than conspiracy. And I believe it more than ever now with 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 covering the uh, covering the royal family. But uh, you know, thanks very much for having me on. Great podcast. Oh, Great. you're more than kind. And, come, back and, and, come back and see us soon, and you're going to get a mug. Phil's going to send you a mug. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> thanks much. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. 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 Well, what a as my mother would have said, what a very nice, polite young man. Yes, he is. No, no, he's good, and I think you know people trust him. Uh, and you know he's very modest, but um, I think very effective. Um, and I'd like yeah. him to do a book on on a subject which I think has never really been addressed, and that's the um, the importance of the outsider in the royal family, the the Camillas, the the Cates, the the Sophies, the Prince Philips, Prince Alberts, who come in and actually introduce, I suspect, change, um, but in a sense play ball with the establishment, and then of course they're the disruptors, the the the, the Megans this world who, who who aren't prepared to play the game. Well, that'll be uh, so I'm going to talk to you about book. that. Well, there we are. We exist to further your business interests, Andrew. <laughs> exactly. Good. Good. <laughs> Keep pushing those thank you buttons. Yes. Um, uh, don't forget, there's a shop as well. If you, you if you, if there's a hole in your life for a scandalmonger's t-shirt or a mug, you know where to go. Well, but uh, yeah. Very interesting perspective. I mean, I think we're beginning to get, in some ways, I think what's interesting is by having so many people talk about the royals from various perspectives, we're getting a very interesting sort of rounded portrait of the way media relations has operated, the, the, some of the, the stories in the royal family, and I hope going beyond what's in the newspaper headlines uh, and indeed some of the books to get it from the horse's mouth about what's happening. You know, I think back, for example, to having had Ailsa Anderson, who was the Queen's press secretary, Patrick Jefferson, Dan. And a secretary. I mean, we've we've got some. Very yes, we have Di Davis, the Royal highly protection. regarded. Di Davis, the Royal Protection Officer. Di Davis. So, so it's not just the commentators, but you know, again, when we get commentators, it's the best. It's Richard Kay, it's Rob Jobson, uh, Andrew Morton. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are this is the A team. They are the A team, and if they're all there for you, uh, the new subscribers, if you're still with us, um, just go back. And the Tina Brown show, actually, that's another one that a lot of people have found. She's very yeah. entertaining and very well informed. I'm yeah, all, and I'm surprised we're not world. getting more for Kitty Kelly and Clive At- Irving. I mean, again, highly respected commentators in the states, well informed. Um, the Tom Sykes, you know, again. I mean, there's quite a yes. quite a bundle there. Yep. So please feel free to pillage the back catalogue, and I hope you enjoy it. And our data man will be monitoring you. That's me. Yes, I only check every couple of hours. <laughs> what about Amazon? Oh, <laughs> uh, you mean Apple, don't you, Andrew? Uh, Apple, no, no, Amazon for your own books. Oh, I don't, actually, yeah, well, I haven't got one for, on, on sale at the moment. I guess the old ones do keep selling. Um, in fact, somebody was very kind on Twitter about the, the, my Diana biography. So yes, I, lots of people. A little spike of interest in that. Yes, and, well, I hope so. It is a good book. Well, maybe I'll update it. I've got to finish my history book first. But maybe I'll go back to Diana because I do oh. think you could write a good chapter about the way that the issues we explore, I explored in that book still play out, as, we, as we've discussed in this program. Um, the legacy. Well, and we've got her brother's book just out about his terrible time at school as a young boy. So, you know, Maybe I need a better ways. agent, Andrew. Are you interested? 
Uh, what, you? Yeah, so, uh, well, who knows? I'd have to do less time of the podcast then. What would people think? That would be a shame. All right. Well, I think we've bent people's ears enough. Um, and thanks again for listening. And to all the new subscribers, uh, yeah. you're so welcome. Please stick around. Yeah. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 